uh, good morning to everyone and thank you very much uh, for being here and join us in this conversation about tax havens uh, impacts on development, uh, which usually uh, the DSA conference is a topic which is almost most of the time quite neglected since the emphasis most of the times are basically always put in the importance of aid, donors, uh, local government, government relations, project implementation, and so on and so forth. But not so much usually talk about the impact of uh, tax havens on development, which I find a little bit weird, uh, just certainly but the, because of the fact that, for example, uh, recent figures shows that uh, $156 billion have been invested in international aid in two, between 2018 and 2019. However, Tax Justice Network recently published that $427 billion in tax revenue have been lost uh, from tax avoidance in 2019. So if you consider these figures, uh, basically the, uh, the, the aid provided by the top 40 donors in the world represents only 36.5% of the taxes that have been avoided in 2019 through this kind of a uh, financial uh, 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 treaties and financial architecture that allows basically individuals and corporations to avoid taxes. Uh, in that sense, basically some estimate talk that low income countries lose to six to 10% of the uh, fiscal revenues to this kind of uh, corporate tax avoidance uh, in the creation of tax treaties or basically that create preferential tax regimes that in some, so, to some extent have engaged the global south in this global race to the bottom that have been involved during the last decades. So the relevance I think is there. And we have a very interesting panel who is gonna basically talk to us about different topics and different aspects of this dynamic globally. So uh, in, in that line, basically to talk more about this in detail about this topic, we have our, our first uh, presenter, which is Luca Milan Narosky which is a senior researcher in the Tax Justice Network and a lawyer in international taxation and had conducted basically uh, postgraduate studies at the Sorbonne in Paris and Boston University. And he's gonna present uh, some research that is the outcome basically of a collective effort that we have prepared in, in partnership with international sector of taxation and development at the Institute of Development Studies. So please Lucas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Miguel. Uh, I will share my screen and start with the presentation. So here we are. Okay. So um, uh, we're going to be talking about tax treaty uh, aggressiveness. So uh, uh, specifically in Africa or with regards to African countries. Um, I cannot change the slides. Okay, yeah, like that. Okay, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about like what are like treaties broadly, uh, followed by challenging a couple of uh, common misconceptions, and then uh, going ahead with the uh, the uh, formalization of like what we considered in the paper that is a, a an aggressive treaty and how uh, we have like uh, formalized it in a a mathematical way, uh, followed by the sources, results, and conclusions. So, like, um, first of all, uh, what is a, a tax treaty? Um, so, it's a contract between uh, two states uh, on the matter of uh, its usually income taxes, uh, including uh, capital gains. But uh, the treaty can also touch on uh, other matters, such like as uh, social security provisions uh, and uh, other taxes. Uh, an important feature is that it overrides um, domestic law. So like if uh, there is like a difference uh, between the treaty and domestic law, usually the treaty applies. But in general, the most favorable uh, legal provision to the taxpayer is the one that uh, applies. Um, uh, what uh, like the uh, tax treaty uh, does uh, is uh, to provide like a like a, like a, a definition of what is like a, a taxable presence 
in uh, each of the uh, uh, partner countries, uh, which can be like a partner to like a bilateral or a multilateral treaty. And essentially what the treaty does is to uh, uh, limit uh, taxation at source. So like, uh, uh, like the uh, host economy, uh, uh, um, Um, so next. So why do countries uh, enter into a tax treaty? So like the first reason is to provide like a uh, legal certainty, meaning like uh, with uh, companies engaging in business uh, across uh, jurisdictions and having this kind of like a uh, legal patchwork of uh, different systems and rules, it provides certainty to have a common set of rules that applies across border. So that a business that is uh, based in one country and that invests in the other uh, 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 can have like, uh, like a, a fixed legal environment when it conducts business. Uh, the second reason, uh, which is twofold, uh, is related to foreign direct investment. So, um, the 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 main uh, uh, function of a, a tax treaty is to lower the tax that will be paid by the foreign investor. So, like in that sense, it provides uh, like it, it it serves like the role of a, a tax exemption. Uh, 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 <laughs> there is also like the matter which is a more controversial of. Uh, that countries enter into tax treaties to increase the volume of uh, foreign direct investment. So like uh, the idea is that if you sign this treaty, you will have a increased investment from the uh, treaty partner, which is not always the case as we will see. And finally, there, are, uh, there can be like non-tax reasons uh, to sign like a tax treaty. Uh, for instance, like uh, the treaty between Australia and the US was uh, signed by Australia with a preferential terms uh, for the US uh, uh, in exchange of uh, opening a military base uh, in Australia. Um, okay, so uh, how are uh, tax treaties uh, created? So like um, uh, it's usually a bilateral negotiations, but uh, as we have seen uh, in recent years, um, mostly through the OECD, we have had like a multilateral negotiations uh, ending up in a, a, a multi-party uh, treaty such as the multilateral instrument or like more recently, I think uh, yesterday is a uh, global tax. So like uh, what happens uh, and is that like uh, there are like a couple of like issues or features in these negotiations is that first there are like a, a, a high, uh, there can be a high disparities between the teams that uh, negotiate like the treaties. Uh, for example, uh, like uh, in the treaties that uh, uh, the UK uh, uh, signed with a uh, global south countries uh, uh, it is common to have like a whole team of like a uh, highly trained and uh, specialized lawyers from the uk that faces uh, the mi uh, ministry uh, uh, minister of uh, finance of uh, the african country for instance and so you have like a uh, one uh, administration official uh, from the global south facing like uh, 10 lawyers which uh, 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 change uh, change every two hours so like uh, if the negotiations go on for like a whole day uh, from like a, a human resource perspective uh, 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 it's very different you know like to hold like a whole day of negotiations or to simply uh, rotate between uh, highly trained professionals there are also uh, disparities in the economic uh, position of uh, two countries, uh, as we will see in the next slide, uh, meaning that like um, um, uh, treaties uh, governing like the uh, cross-border investment between two or more countries 
uh, uh, it is often like the case that the that the that the uh, that the amounts that one country's businesses invest in the other country is much larger than the amounts that the other country invests uh, in the first country. Meaning that like the flows are asymmetric. So like if uh, like a, a treaty, even a, a treaty with symmetric terms applies to different uh, uh, quantities, this means that there is like an uh, like an uh, uh, like a, a, a disparity uh, uh, in the tax base that is covered by the treaty from the perspective of each partner. Finally, as uh, maybe uh, Martin Hearson has uh, studied, there is a huge influence of a uh, business lobbies uh, putting pressure on uh, mostly like the the administration of their uh, residence country uh, uh, to uh, try to have like the best terms possible to pay the lowest tax possible in foreign countries. Um, and finally, like uh, uh, there are like tax treaty models uh, um, that uh, usually drive negotiating positions, uh, where uh, each country will try to uh, obtain like a treaty that is the closest possible to different models. So broadly, the UN model is more favorable to source uh, 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 source taxation, which is directly linked to domestic revenue. Mobilization, the like, like, like the, the ability of a country to raise revenues to then finance uh, uh, public services and so on. And, and the OECD model is more favorable to the country of residence of the investor. So that would be between uh, the UK and Kenya, it would be at the UK. So the country where the investors usually. Uh, reside okay so this uh, uh, this shows like the like the uh, different economic positions uh, between like uh, outward and inward investment so here we can see that uh, like uh, high income countries are uh, are uh, set to win uh, in these uh, 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 treaties as I said before, so if you have like a symmetric treaty, so like a, a treaty that uh, applies in exactly the same way to uh, both contracting parties, that there is one contracting party who, ho who hosts all investment and the other contracting party where the investor always resides, when you set like a, a tax exemption under the treaty, it will apply mostly to the uh, country of residence that is the high income country. So uh, in short, um, uh, poor countries have much more to lose than, uh, than uh, rich countries. Uh, as we see here, the um, uh, uh, capital exporters are uh, 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 only like a, a, a small part of the world economy. So, the effect of tax treaties are broadly to change the volume and uh, or nature of investment flows. Volume is like the, the amount, as I mentioned before, and nature. It can be also like uh, uh, the type of, of flow that uh, that goes on. It can be, for example, a phantom, a phantom investment. So just like routing, a, 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 let's say, paper profits through a jurisdiction to benefit from a a treaty, uh, uh, it can be also like uh, mergers and acquisitions. So like just like purchasing shares, there will be like a money flow, uh, but uh, which will be accounted as uh, FDI, but like it's not like the uh, like the uh, for an investment that we often uh, think of of like like bringing money to build a factory and employ people. So like the nature of investment uh, can change. So there can uh, there are also like uh, by definition changes in the allocation of the tax base, and with them uh, changes in tax revenues, and uh, very importantly, uh, network 
a network effects. So like it's very different to sign a treaty with a country that has almost no other treaties, meaning that like the exposure of your treaty partner in the global network is very small, meaning like when money flows from uh, the host country to this country with few treaties, the money cannot flow uh, as easily to other countries. But for example, if you sign like a treaty with a country that has many treaties, like uh, uh, like the Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, Mauritius, or the UAE, you're exposing yourself to like a whole other set of countries. Meaning that, for example, if you sign a treaty with Mauritius, knowing that Mauritius has a treaty with France, is as if you signed a, a a treaty with France. There can be some clauses in the treaty that limit this kind of uh, gains, but it is uh, often like the case that there is like a network effect, meaning that like a uh, uh, multinationals do what's called like treaty shopping to like decide to route like the profits through uh, specific jurisdictions that allow them uh, to play with that. So like uh, two common uh, misconceptions in the study of treaties. First, the tax treaties are necessary to eliminate a double taxation. So like uh, um, uh, like how uh, um, uh, treaties work, as I mentioned before, is by limiting taxation at source. This is uh, done by uh, through a uh, through exemption, meaning like the, that uh, like like the treaty says that like the uh, source country cannot charge tax over a certain uh, a certain amount or cannot church tax uh, at all. So this is how treaties uh, try to solve a double taxation. However, this is not like the only way to do it. For example, it can be done through domestic law, uh, for example, through the provision of a tax credits, meaning that like when the uh, country of residence of the investor receives like, a, like an economic flow that has been taxed in the foreign country, it simply will offset its own tax with the tax paid by the foreign country, thus avoiding a double taxation, even in the absence of a treaty. Uh, therefore, treaties are not necessary to eliminate a double taxation and can actually often uh, result in double non-taxation if the treaty limits taxation at source and then the country of residence doesn't tax. The second common misconception is, is that, uh, as I mentioned before, entering into a treaty increases uh, FDI. So uh, there are like a vast number of uh, studies and even like a couple of like uh, meta studies uh, and uh, like the results are like uh, at best uh, mixed as the IMF says, uh, uh, meaning that like uh, uh, there are uh, all sorts of effects, positive, negative, uh, not significant, and meta studies find that it's not significant. So like we cannot uh, 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 say today with current uh, uh, current research that treaties increase uh, FDI. And second, uh, uh, as we uh, mentioned before, like uh, FDI does not mean real economic activity. It can be phantom investment, it can be uh, mergers and acquisitions. And, uh, and, and also, even if uh, uh, we assume that treaties increase uh, FDI, FDI uh, can, uh, uh, can come with the uh, worsening of labor conditions and environmental degradation. So like, even if it did, that would not be like a, like a, like a reason or a why to enter into tax treaties. Okay, so like we're going now to proceed. Uh, how much time I have left to know like how Oh, it's like 20 minutes already. <laughs> um, um, I, I'll just like go because like uh, this is kind of like the core of the paper. <laughs> so um, uh, quickly. I cannot hear Miguel, sorry. Uh, if the others are fine, you can take five more minutes to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. So like uh, uh, what we actually do um, uh, in the paper is like to study uh, like what's a, a, an aggressive treaty. So, like, first, like, to understand, like, the concept is that, like, a, uh, aggressiveness is like a relative. So, think, for instance, like, what, like, like, like the way that most intuitively we think about aggressiveness is, 
a physical contact. So like if we consider like the same physical contact, let's say like a, like a, a punch or, or something with like the same strength to these two characters, uh, even if the punch is like the same in absolute terms, it is not in relative terms, right? Because one uh, actor is used to a certain kind of a physical contact and not the other. So like uh, what we uh, do uh, with uh, uh, tax treaties is to define uh, aggressiveness in this way. So like uh, how, how, uh, um, how much like a tax treaty reduces a uh, uh, tax right, uh, tax rights or uh, tax rates in comparison to the other treaties signed by uh, the host country. So uh, mathematically, it looks like that. So here we have, for example, the case of uh, Rwanda with respects to a uh, dividend. So like Rwanda has uh, five treaties with Singapore, uh, Jersey, Belgium, Mauritius, and South Africa. And uh, with regards to dividends, uh, we have different rates. So for instance, here, Belgium and Singapore would be reducing rates below uh, what is usual in Rwanda's treaty network. So like uh, here on the right side of the table, you can see that uh, while Jersey and Mauritius with regards to dividends are not considered aggressive, Singapore and Belgium, they are. So uh, we measure different uh, types of aggressiveness. Uh, a couple of them uh, with regards to a withholding tax rates, which is the easiest quantifiable uh, 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 feature of a tax treaty. And then uh, we use uh, the uh, 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 source index uh, data uh, developed by uh, Martin Hearson, which has a very important uh, qualitative components that are uh, uh, coded as uh, qualitative uh, variables. So for instance, like can the source country tax the a capital gains on a, a, a shares of a, a land rich company. Um, okay, so like a, our two research question is like, what are the most aggressive countries and how sensitive are the findings to the, these different measures of a treaty content? So our sources are first of all, uh, IBFD, uh, which has only withholding rates, but the advantage is that it has both treaty and domestic uh, withholding rates. Uh, the second source is uh, the ICTD, uh, uh, and this uh, has like the enormous advantage of uh, having a, a permanent establishment uh, provisions. So like this, like uh, when do we consider that a foreign company has a taxable presence and other treaty provisions? So our sample includes 455 treaties that are all treaties concluded between African countries and other countries, and we consider Seychelles and Mauritius uh, as aggressors, but not as uh, African countries because they have basically zero tax results. So like considering only uh, 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 withholding rates, we see that uh, the UAE, France and Mauritius are the uh, most aggressive. Here with the different colors, we can see like, like how, much, how much aggressiveness is attributed to different kinds of uh, flows. Uh, then we do like a small variation of this model considering a domestic withholding rates. So in the previous model, we are comparing like a, a treaty rate with the a treaty average. And here we're comparing the treaty rate to uh, the domestic rate. So like uh, here we see that the uh, UK uh, seems to be like much uh, better in getting the rates that are lower than a uh, the domestic rates when it actually does more similarly than uh, than other trees. Uh, so like the uh, more, uh, th this model or France and the UAE and uh, uh, the UK. And finally, this is like the last uh, like uh, model uh, 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 where uh, we consider permanent establishment and other treaty provisions. So here we see that the UAE and Mauritius are relatively like less aggressive than uh, most uh, most EU countries uh, South Korea Norway uh, etc but France is still at the top um, so by cluster we see that like those that are more uh, more aggressive or 
G7 countries, OECD, uh, certain EU countries, uh, African tax havens, that means like uh, Mauritius and Seychelles, and uh, in general, like capital exporting countries. Uh, we don't have time to zoom in. <laughs> uh, the conclusions, uh, so this is what I just uh, talked about. Uh, what are the most aggressive countries in reducing source tax and rights? Here they are. <clears throat> How sensitive are the findings uh, to different measures of aggressiveness? So like uh, rich OECD and certain uh, EU countries uh, uh, appear much more aggressive when we include this consideration of a uh, permanent establishment uh, and uh, other treaty provisions. Uh, just like quickly to explain what, uh, uh, how permanent establishment is uh, relevant. Uh, so uh, for instance, like that's why like uh, Google does not pay tax in most countries because Google derives uh, advertising uh, revenues for most countries and those in many treaties are excluded so meaning like if you're like a foreign business and you only do advertisement in the other country you're you don't have like a permanent establishment and thus the other country cannot charge tax uh, and uh, like uh, how sensitive are the findings to uh, so uh, with regards to france uh, it is, it is consistently the most aggressive country with regards to the African country, the country that uh, uh, that, that that most uh, reduces a uh, source taxing rights. Uh, and then, um, yeah, we Lucas, have, yeah, Lucas yeah. we have to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much to Lucas for a very fascinating and very interesting uh, presentation, rich in information and um, mathematical and econometric analysis. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we really certainly, uh, Lucas, I think the paper is out already, yeah? You're circulating the paper. And it will be out uh, 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 this month, like maybe like at the end of the uh, next week or so, uh, but soon. So that's very important for those who are interested. Uh, the name of the paper is Tax Treaty Aggressiveness, who is undermining taxing rights in Africa. Uh, so thank you very much, Lucas, for that presentation. It was fantastic. Uh, now, um, it's important to remember that so as some basically have argued, tax avoidance and illicit financial flows uh, can be related, but are not necessarily the same. So it's very important uh, here is basically Rogelio Madrileño para, to re explain to us a little bit more about that and trying to understand the dimensions of dirty money in developing countries uh, with a paper uh, title, what drive offshore upper domain? That's Dan and <laughs> um, for the sake of a sustained global order, the dimension are cartography of dirty money in developing countries. So uh, Rogelio uh, is a researcher at the University of Bonn in Germany. He has published extensively in international journals, including uh, journals as World Development. And this basically is a joint paper he's presenting this morning and sharing also a recent research they are doing. So Rogelio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, and I'm very happy to be here in this uh, <clears throat> well, great panel, very interesting. I, I, I love the presentation from Lucas, very interesting paper, and I'm sure that Valentina will present also, and, and, and Daniel, very nice uh, paper. So I'm happy to be with very talented people. And um, well, and this, uh, um, this paper is a work in progress um, um, paper that um wait a second um, yes uh and the aim is to um oh, what is that I need to go oh, wait a second yes and the main idea is to uh to analyze the issue of uh, illicit financial flows uh, through the lens of uh, the emergence and consolidation of the contemporary uh, international system. And so we have like two, two uh, sections, uh, uh, like in the previous uh, presentation, just first a theoretical framework and then uh, uh, the empirical uh, part. And in, in this uh, second part of this empirical uh, um, analysis, the idea is to show the main factors behind illicit financial flows and, and also to provide a, a quasi-cartographic view of the complex, uh, complexities of this issue. So um, uh, 
our hypothesis, uh, so it is, uh, I forgot to say, it's a work, it's, it's, this is a paper that I'm working uh, um, with uh, Magdalena Silverberger, who, uh, well, due to family reasons, couldn't join today. But um, well, the, the, the hypothesis of this paper is that the international financial flows are the result of an asymmetric post-war uh, international economic order and power-based system which promotes mechanisms and conditions that foster financial instability and also new relations of the dependence between rich and poor countries. And uh, this leads to a weak multilateralism to address global threats such as uh, illicit financial flows and also to a non-inclusive global financial governance. Uh, so when we talk about illicit financial flows, we are emphasizing the roots um, of the symmetries uh, of, uh, of the international monetary and financial system. And as we know, um, um, the Bretton Woods uh, Conference laid a foundation for hegemonic stability through the implementation of key geopolitical and strategic objectives of the US uh, in a long-term perspective. So the Bretton Woods Conference confronted uh, two competing visions, as we know, the, the approach, the non-hegemonic approach provided by Keynes, and also the uh, more pragmatic approach provided by um, um, Harry Dexter uh, White. And um, on the one hand, Keynes, uh, well, the idea of Keynes was to provide a supranational um, solution through a monetary use, uh, unit, uh, so-called Bancor, um, in order to bring stability to the uh, international monetary system by um, um, well, providing this clearance uh, of balances between countries. So the main idea is that surplus and deficit countries would split the burden of uh, global trade surplus to the benefit of deficit countries. And a, a key element here was um, um, that it was important to uh, set up the incentives to persuade creditor nations to spend their surplus money back into the economies of the debtor nations. Um, as we know, this, uh, this um, proposal didn't win, but, um, but uh, the, the proposal of White, who essentially deployed the construction and design of the national security of the US in three main strands the economic and financial strand um, through the consolidation of the hegemonic currency, the dollar, the military security and the strategic strand. And by doing this, the US, uh, of course, they assume that they want to, to uh, take the most of the, this uh, current account surplus uh, strategy, while at the same time, uh, well, mm, the US was able to impose uh, its model on the, um, the rules of the international and monetary financial system. And uh, also in this framework, as we know, there were introduced two relevant compensatory elements also to, to, um, to bridge uh, to, to the proposal of Keynes. And then um, it was created to, to international, to, to very relevant institutions, the world today, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But the issue here, as many scholars have suggested from different perspectives, is that um, mm, uh, this post-war order shaped by the US has developed a surplus recycling mechanism, which performs the functions of a, a global minotaur in, in, in the words of Varoufakis. And this is a metaphor of the tribute that Athenians had to pay to create to feed the minotaur. And this resembles a key feature of the global economic system where the surpluses generated by the great beneficiaries of the world economy are recycled in form of capital inflows by the US through a complex institutional and financial system that help finance the US twin deficit. And um, additionally, this framework facilitates uh, three main uh, goals to promote international, the international credit system, to encourage foreign investment by transnational corporations, and to promote uh, the investment of uh, US treasury bonds. Uh, this uh, um, surplus recycling mechanism is, uh, however, uh, far from being a linear process. It is rather full of uh, transitions and changes. 
so in, in the initial phase of the Bretton Woods system, the surplus from the US economy was recycled in Europe and Asia to create the necessary demand for US exports. But after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, there was a new transition to a new international uh, financial system, which uh, is uh, characterized by uh, well, some key elements such as uh, the shift from a system of fixed to flexible exchange rates, the deregulation of a, a domestic financial market, the integration of financial uh, markets through a monetary and financial interdependence and changes in, in capital uh, controls, um, also the globalization of intellectual property rights, among others. So the complement to the surplus recycle mechanism is, is the hypothesis of the uh, global hydra. Um, that we are just um, suggesting in this paper. So according to, to the Greek mythology, there was a, a many-headed monster, the Hydra, um, uh, with the capacity to regenerate itself. So uh, each time a warrior was able to chop off one of the Hydra's that had uh, another one appears uh, very soon. So that makes the, 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 the Hydra a, a permanent threat. And only through the cooperation of Heracles and, and his uh, servant or, or nephew, uh, Ilus, it was possible to defeat the, this, uh, this monster. So um, in, in line with our argument, there is evidence that the system has created new heads in the form of mechanisms of destruction and surplus or recycling. Um, uh, which not only result in the implementation of new relations of dependency be between rich and poor countries, but also complex uh, and multifaceted uh, crises that are, that are sources of global instability and unsustainability. Un unsustainability. So um, the post-war si economic system has created a broader set of actions, policies, that uh, might disguise the assistance for financing the gaps and, um, and, and, and the fight against asymmetries uh, in developing country, uh, countries through greater uh, structural conditionality programs uh, within the International Monetary Fund, but also through um, a broader institutional framework that aims to endorse the expansion of international investment law to protect uh, private um, uh, inter intellectual property rights, uh, foreign direct investment and profitability from uh, multinational corporations as in the previous uh, uh, presentation. So um, the main, so an example of this would be uh, something like this. And um, so this uh, surplus recycle mechanism resembles a global hedger with a different speeds and in, in various dimensions uh, over time, promoting a vision of a unified system. So each dimension, uh, well, these uh, examples of, it, of this multiple dimension, it has uh, reflects a uh, key elements of um, economic and financial globalization, but also the root of the unequal distribution of income and the hegemonic structure of the international monetary system. Uh, of course, through the dominance of the um, of the uh, monetary to the uh, monetary dominance of the U.S. and this figure shows, for instance, the interconnection of the institutional, commercial, productive, uh, legal, uh, monetary, and uh, financial and policy structures that provide, on the whole, hidden mechanisms of extraction and surplus uh, appropriation of developing countries based on the loopholes of the current uh, tax uh, system. So while some aspects highlight the central position of the US dollar, uh, for instance, uh, dollar assets on liabilities in banks and non-financial non firms, um, or oil prices price in dollars, or uh, dollar denominated debts, um, the, the, the system also provides uh, some uh, stability through a set of uh, relevant um, financial in institutions, such as um, um, well, these ones, 
this uh, also uh, interesting study uh, um, where um, these institutions uh, about I, I want The, the names of, the, of uh, each, but well, I can do that. Well, I mean, uh, uh, um, these uh, institutions, um, they, which are, uh, we had the capacity to to uh, uh, to change the rule of the system, and they somehow just uh, focus on on provide just, uh, let's say. Um, stable system that not uh, the other countries or for the global south but also a, a, a very asymmetric uh, uh, un, uh, uneven um, um, bias uh, uh, in favor of uh, high income countries so in, in terms of for instance of this this uh, global uh, safety network um, of institutions that uh, aims to uh, to provide lending capacity to to face a short term crisis. I mean, we 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 saw that this um, uh, this lending capacity is mainly focused on um, on high uh, income um, countries. Okay, so um, and. Uh, wait, this one. The movement of money across borders that is illegal in source, in transfer, and its use. So uh, the main, um, uh, some of the main uh, components of the illicit financial flows are, um, well, as it can be seen in the in the uh, slide, the issue of corruption, tax abuse, uh, market abuse, or uh, money uh, laundering. And the idea of this paper is to to uh, explore this this also um, idea empirically, and um, and then uh, what we do is to um, we use a um, main dimension uh, within this uh, within the, the current literature of illicit financial flows, and then we uh, use this. Um, that I mentioned with different indicators in order to uh, to obtain the main factors that explain variables that we are using. Just uh, this this can be uh, summarized or just uh, concentrated into four components, and these four components uh, um, are mainly uh, governance issues. And within governance issues, we have uh, what well, we have uh, on, on the left the the, the the name of the of the variable uh, and, and the, also the, the correlation. So the, the higher the correlation, the, the better the, the, the explanation of the uh, within the, the each dimension or each component. So in the case of governance, so, so we, we have that rule of law would be the most important um, variable explaining the, uh, the uh, this um, this component in, in in the component of trade and, and finance issues would be. Uh, with very, very uh, similar and strong correlation, the issue of foreign direct investment inflows and, and the issue of trade in terms of bank, bank stability would be the, the issue of both the variable of bank stability, but also the variable of homicide or criminality. And uh, in terms of tax collection. So we are using these uh, four variables to, to uh, Try to 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 build a a, a, a cartography or a, um, through a cluster analysis, clustering analysis, and uh, so one more thing. So and we are um, dividing the the the, um, the analysis into two into two main um, um, let's say, let's say um, components. First, uh, as we saw previously. Here, the, uh, that we saw that in trend and final issue, there are two main uh, uh, variables for indirect, direct investment and trade. So we use um, we use proxies to to try to reflect these two uh, main uh, components in in our uh, cluster analysis, and we use uh, um, for foreign direct investment the, the the variable of phantom investment. And for uh, the issue of trade misinvoicing, we use the illicit financial uh, 
uh, flow gaps or, or value gaps that it is also provided by, by global financial integrity. So we have here that um, two uh, main important books. Wait a second. They are in the case of uh, the phantom investment, there are, uh, I mean, the, the, if we want to see the, the, the most important um, Rogelio, variables. You have, Rogel, Rogelio, you have two more minutes. Okay, so I, 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 will, I, will, I will go directly to the, to the conclusion. So what, what the, the important here is that, is that we make this, uh, this uh, analysis of this to, these two uh, um, um, different uh, perspectives of the problem. And we, we, what we obtain here is that we have in, in both analysis, in the case of uh, phantom investment and, and, and trade uh, uh, illicit financial gaps, we have in, in these two analyses four, uh, four clusters. Um, uh, the most important, I mean, the uh, cluster would be, uh, or analysis would be the issue of uh, phantom investment with this composition of countries. So is, is this, each composition reflects a, 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 a different, um, let's say, a specialization or, or, uh, or problematic of uh, each uh, country in terms of uh, the, the components that we, that we saw in, in, in the factor analysis. And also uh, in the case of trade, um, so we, we can that dis discuss that in the, in, the, in, the, in the question and answers. And, um, but in the case of the um, trade is invoicing, we also find uh, uh, four clauses, but with different compositions. So what, but the point important here is the issue that we have only one, one cluster with, uh, let's say, a geopolitical uh, um, explanation that has to do with uh, is, uh, one single country uh, with, uh, is uh, the country of Iraq. We also have very, very relevant um, geopolitical connotations and problematic of illicit financial flows in the last years. Um, finally, the, in terms of conclusions, well, the idea of this paper is to provide a platform of reflection and analysis of the challenges of illicit financial flows. Um, also, well, to stress the idea that uh, illicit financial flows shouldn't be seen as an isolated action, but a, a part of a global strategy by means of a, a, a demonic uh, stock order cycle mechanism uh, that it was born uh, to, to provide the, 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 the US, uh, let's say, um, or, or to, to enhance the US uh, national productive and security interest. But with the time, what we found is that uh, the, system, the system allowed to create uh, other uh, stock order cycle mechanisms by other uh, emerging economies. Uh, so we've, we've, what we face is that we face a struggle between different software recycling mechanisms, the strategies, but there is, is, is still just one hegemonic uh, 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 mechanism within this. And then we, we try to show the problem of uh, illicit, uh, illicit financial flows in order to, to, uh, to show the main factors within this problem and then to also to try to provide a quasi cartographic view of this problem uh, or, uh, and, um, in order to show the heterogeneity and, and, the, and the different nature of this problem. Uh, and, um, and also the, the big um, challenge that uh, developing countries will face uh, in, um, well, in the future. So, well, so I, I will leave it here and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rogelio, for a very interesting uh, presentation, very rich in terms of empirical data, but as well establishing the linkages between the geopolitical context and the historical development, obviously, and the historical institutional formation of the international order. So very interesting indeed, and thank you very much for your presentation. Now, basically, we have uh, the presentation from Don Harvey and and Valentina. Uh, Dan is a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Sussex and has also published widely international journals, including environment in, journals as environment and planning. Uh, Dan is presenting with uh, Valentina Gulo, which is a research fellow at University of Sussex. And Dan and Valentina are working together in a research project funded by the UK Foreign Office 
foreign office to seek to understand how the changes in the uh, re international regulation have impact the use of shell companies uh, for illicit financial flows. And they're going to pr be presenting this morning a paper titled What Drive Offshore Shell Company Formation? A Novel Time Series Panel re uh, Regression Analysis Using Panama and Paradise uh, Papers Leakers Data from 1990 to 2015. So please, Dan, Valentina, welcome. Uh, thanks, Miguel. <clears throat> okay, so our talk today is called What Drives Offshore Shell Company Formation? A uh, novel panel regression analysis of Panama and Paradise Papers leak data, uh, which as Miguel says, it's part of a larger um, anti-corruption evidence program grant, grant that we're working on. Uh, funded by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office uh, that we're running with Alex Cobham at the Tax Justice Network. Um, so the organizational backbone of the global offshore or tax haven system is basically shell companies. Um, so it's a bit murky what's a shell company, but essentially you can say it's a legal entity based in a jurisdiction where it has no real business being. It's established there as some sort of a conduit or a platform for activities elsewhere. Shell companies are not a footnote in the world economy. This is what all of the world's foreign direct investment looks like. Um, so people think about foreign direct investment, this is supposed to be something real like factories or mergers and acquisitions. It turns out about two thirds of it actually is going in or out of places where it's basically, um, we call shell company jurisdictions. It's hard to say exactly how much of this doesn't really belong there, but I think you can confidently say that most of the world's FDI is basically going through shell companies. You could almost call it a kind of a waste byproduct of various forms of arbitrage to a large extent. Um, it's especially important in developing countries. So shell companies play a central role as the sort of backbone in all these different problems from capital flight to illicit financial flows, linked to all sorts of causes we heard about in the previous talk, tax evasion and avoidance, both foreign and local, and also the structuring of local business in all sorts of different ways. The problem is, is that there's so many different issues that this is relevant to and so many different causes for shell company formation, these sorts of flows in developing countries that we end up having a largely sort of incoherent muddy picture of what's going on and more precisely what the most important factors are. Um, so to give an example, there's a sort of a general idea that this is linked to weak institutions, but there's all sorts of reasons that could be the case that get thrown out. It could be that it's the actual illicit behavior, the sort of illegally obtained money that's fleeing. It could be that it's the honest money fleeing the bad environment, or it could be that it's not capital flight at all. One thing people argue is actually businesses in developing countries take advantage of these as cheap platforms to structure themselves organizationally, sometimes for round tripping in a way that could even be positive. Um, so in some sense, this phenomenon is overexplained, and you put it all together, we end up with a kind of incoherent picture. Um, the problem is that we really need empirical evidence to figure out what's sort of actually going on. What we have it right now is the equivalent of someone saying, like, well, people go to the doctor for all sorts of different reasons, but the question is, well, yes, but what's the actual breakdown of why this is happening, which is what we don't have. And a key part of this is what we really need are sort of long-scale, long-term, preferably global, time series panel regression analyses where we can really sort of probe at these causality issues. The problem is, is that the data necessary to do this hasn't really existed and to some extent doesn't really exist in a sort of conventional form. So you look at both existing macro and micro level data, for example, the IMF coordinated direct investment survey or micro level data such as Orbis, they're really all very badly suited for this sort of large scale panel regression analysis. Um, first, they don't cover enough history to really do a good time series analysis. They all start relatively recently. Just as importantly, they're actually all biased away from coverage of the things that we're most interested in. Essentially, the poorer a country is, the more sort of problems it has in a general sense, the less likely it is to be represented at all in this data sets. Um, plus, in the micro data, the sorts of illicit secretive stuff is basically systematically omitted. So it's actually the data itself is a mirror image of the thing that we want to study, in addition to being too short. Um, the thing is, though, is there's been this incredible data set, the sort of massive data set that's fallen out of the sky several years ago. Um, these ICAJ leak data sets, Panama Paradise Papers. We have hundreds of thousands of companies formed by clients and hundreds of companies over a period of several decades. Um, 
And essentially what we've been working on in this project is figuring out how to use this. And basically what we've shown is actually, there are some very significant advantages, keeping in mind the limitations of the weak leak data, but there's specific advantages when you're trying to do this kind of long-term global panel regression analysis to figure out what's driving the shell company formation. Um, firstly, one thing to point out is even though these are data leaks, they're actually covering a pretty large part of the entire world of shell companies. Um, these are sort of best guess figures of what percentage of all of the companies in these various jurisdictions are covered. Um, so sort of double digit percentages in most of the key jurisdictions. Another thing is if you look at the coverage by jurisdiction, it seems to be inversely related to the proprietary data sets. Uh, such as Orbis, it suggests that actually it's sort of capturing the missing piece, all the secretive, probably illicit stuff that's not in the other data sets. Um, also, we just know because it's been dug into its sort of um, case study levels, a lot of interesting stuff going on. So this is mapping out what percentage of companies in different countries are known to be linked to politically exposed persons. It turns out actually like a double digit percentage of all shell companies are just even the known languages are connected to PEP. So a lot of really important connections to corruption. Um, incredibly rich geographically. This is a figure we put together um, for another paper in our project, just showing for the PEP link companies, um, basically where the origin jurisdiction is by sort of region color coded, um, what the sort of service provider administration center is, the sort of grayed out spheres, and then where the companies are incorporated. So you can drop in all of these geographic dimensions over a long time series. Most importantly, though, is we have multiple independent data leaks that you can use to corroborate each other. And actually, you can see the Panama and Paradise papers don't even look that similar. But as we'll show, you tend to get the same results when you run regressions on both. What that shows is that the biases seem to be random um, in a way that allows these to be used in a useful way. Um, so basically what we're doing, we're making use of these leaked data sets to conduct a quantitative analysis, trying to figure out what is it out of all of these possible important factors that's driving shell company formation and developing and transition economies. And what we're doing is a very large scale, um, long-term time series panel regression analysis, basically all developing and transition client economies over a 24 year period from 1991 to 2010, with a sort of a broad exploratory analysis um, to try to figure out you just, I mean, it's, it's because nobody has really done this before, we almost don't even know where to start in terms of targeted hypothesis testing. So we're basically trying to, well, we'll look at everything that's possibly relevant and see like what actually is there. At the same time, applying very, very rigorous sensitivity and robustness checks to make sure that we're not just p-hacking and pulling out noise. So we wanna see a result consistently through a large number of different sample and model variations. And uh, so Valentina will talk a bit more about the methodology that we're using. Okay, yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, so first of all, let's talk about our dependent variable, uh, which as Daniel said, uh, is uh, the count of companies incorporated from each client country in each uh, incorporation country, which are offshore financial centers. And this count of companies is GDP normalized to account for different size of countries. And uh, also, since we have conducted some regression for individual service providers, so only with Apple by data or Massa Fonseca data and some other regression with the two service provider pooled. In this case, we have also rescaled the dependent variable to account for the different dimension of the two data sets. We have only taken into account developing and transition country clients that are also offshore, onshore economies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the first problem that we had to face is the fact that in the literature it has been proven that um, illicit financial flows uh, from developing countries have autoregressive patterns. So we needed to control for the fact that our dependent variable depends from its past value. And so we have augmented the regressions with the one year lag of the dependent variable. Also, we have augmented all the, all the models with uh, the lags of uh, the client country risk variables. And this is to account for the fact that usually when a reform is enacted for instance, uh, uh, privatization or liberalization reform is enacted, usually the effect is not observable right after the enactment, but you need to wait for one or two years to see the effect. And so we also accounted for that uh, using lags of the axis as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, how did we analyze the data? We used a 
pseudo-gravity empirical, empirical aggression, uh, um, regression for our panel analysis. So why using gravity? So we do not have an actual flow because what we have is the count of companies that are, are formed from clients in a country in offshore financial centers. So this is not actually a flow, but we decided to treat this as a flow for two reasons. First of all, the data are extremely heteroscedastic, and so we needed a way to account for that. And second, we have a lot of zeros. Plus, we have a cross-sectional unit, which is not only the client country, but which is composed by the uh, client uh, of show financial center pair. And so we decided to apply a gravity method to that. Um, to sum, uh, to summarize everything, we basically conducted the sum regressions, uh, which are one dimensional. So we only look at the client country um, dimension and uh, another set of regression, which is two dimensional. So client and incorporation. And uh, we have years ranging from 91 to, to 2015. Next slide. Okay. Uh, as uh, is common practice in gravity literature, we have used the fixed effects to control for um, origin service provider, destination service provider, and time service provider level variation. This allows us both to control for an, observ uh, for an, an, an observables in the model, and also to control for um, changes in the uh, simultaneous changes in the jurisdictions, and also for changes related to, uh, for instance, the internal structure of service providers themselves. Um, next slide. The uh, estimation has been done by PPML, which is the praxis to estimate a gravity equation that allows us both to control for the heteroscedasticity and the zero inflation uh, in the model that I've mentioned before. Uh, and we also use the st standard errors clustered over country pairs. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Daniel said before, we put particular emphasis on sensitivity and robustness. Uh, we, uh, the results that Daniel will present in a bit are derived from a very large number of models that we have run based on a combination of different leak data set and uh, based on different formation thresholds because we, don't, we didn't really care to find if one uh, why one, one variable was significant in any one model, but we needed to find find where we had a stable and consistent result over different samples, like varying small things. Um, next slide. So uh, talking about the independent variables now, we have divided them into two groups, institutional and political and economic and financial. So starting with institutional and political variables, uh, the first two uh, variables that we present are state ownership and legal and transparency property rights, which are level variables. These uh, are also um, uh, inserted in the model in their change ver version, so the change with respect to the um, uh, precedent year. And so state ownership is also expressed as two different variables, which are nation nationalization and for positive shock and privatization for negative shock shock and uh, transparency and private property rights uh, 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 as also a positive shock version and a negative shock version. Now, what's important to clarify at this point is that we expect uh, uh, that uh, all of this variable basically uh, creates spikes for different reasons uh, in shell company formation, as Daniel also um, anticipated before. Now, since these two dimensions are very likely to operate together, um, uh, we merge them uh, with factor analysis, creating uh, a, another level variable called the liberalism, which is in turn divided into uh, type of shocks, liberalization for a positive change and illiberalization for a negative change. Um, so uh, base things to keep in mind is that we expect both positive and negative changes to create spikes uh, because there uh, may uh, be like uh, less incentive to um, 
to invest after uh, an improvement, for instance, in property rights law, or could, there could be like more opportunities for investment. So we could uh, either observe a positive or a negative spike. Now, uh, we also have uh, um, a last institutional variable, which is political stability, uh, which accounts for the long term effect, uh, which is uh, uh, expressed in the model as a regime change event variable from polity. Uh, now, uh, jumping to the economic and financial variables, we account for the level and the change in natural resource rent, foreign aid, external debt, and IMF crisis lending uh, as a percentage of GDP. And then for GDP growth and GDP per capita, it is important to underline that uh, actually uh, GDP is not just an additional control, but uh, uh, also tells us if there is a procyclical effect, meaning that it tells us if what we are observing is normal business or if there is something strange going on, like money flying out for the country for like um, reasons that are not the usual uh, investment ones. Okay, uh, thanks for seeing it. I think we should you. probably go to the results. Thank you. Sure we have yes. Okay. So we've done a main result, a main analysis is time series analysis, but we've also done a cross sectional analysis to try to compare countries as a first step to just sort of characterize what sort of developing transition economies tend to have more shell companies. Um, and, and like as in the previous talk, we've sort of made use of factor analysis to help us with this for the same reasons discussed that everything is sort of related to each other and correlated. And so what we've basically done is bundled together various hibernations of raw variables and factors of different sample variations um, to try to conduct a sensitivity analysis. Essentially the way to read this is this is a sort of a meta analysis of our own data. So if you see a lot of bars and darker bars sticking off to the right, that shows that a variable is consistently significant positive impact. If you see a lot of sort of orange and red bars sticking off to the left, that shows it's consistently negative. Um, so the first thing, and you see is a sort of three bundles of variables that are closely related to each other that we can extract these common factors. The first thing that really stands out is above all, it's aid dependent, highly indebted poor countries that have the highest level of shell company formation in a chronic sense. What's interesting though, is out of all of those factors, it's very clearly foreign aid dependence that's the kind of master explainer, um, not just of shell company formation, but interestingly of all of the other independent variables. You would sort of expect that something like, um, for example, per capita income would be the sort of key explainer, but actually it turns out it's foreign aid dependency. We also find that in general, poor economic performance and political instability are related both to each other and to higher levels of shell company formation. So neither of those is especially surprising. What is surprising though is we found there actually seems to be an inverse relationship, which is relatively robust between natural resource dependence and shell company formation propensity, um, which in turn creates a sort of a general relationship that's a bit, um, the sort of an optical illusion where it looks like the sort of more liberal countries with stronger institutions actually have more shell companies, but it seems to be a kind of a side effect of the inverse relationship with resource rent dependence. It's not a subtle effect. You can actually see it once you know what to look for. If you just look at the map, there's almost holes for places like Angola, Nigeria, Iraq. They're sort of disproportionately low compared to what you would expect. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. What's especially puzzling is there's a very strongly correlated time series pro-cyclical relationship between overall shell company formation and the commodity price cycle at the global level, keeping in mind the causality here moves in multiple complicated directions. Um, all right, so that's a sort of characterization at the cross-sectional level. Our main analysis, though, is time series panel regression. Um, again, as in the previous charts, what this is showing is how consistently and robustly we get a result in a particular direction. Um, what we've done crucially is that we separated countries out based on whether they have communist history, um, given the expectation they'll behave qualitatively different, which we'll show they actually do. Um, so the first thing we find is, so remember, aid dependence cross-sectionally is very strongly related to shell company formation. At the same time, in cross-sectional analysis, it's difficult to draw causal connections. What we show though is that actually there's also a very consistent time series relationship. So it looks like this is not just spurious. Actually aid goes in and it just goes right back out into shell companies. There's a clear causal linkage happening here um, that's really very important. 
We also find IMF crisis lending is pretty robustly associated. Um, so IMF assistance, foreign aid assistance comes in and goes back out into shell companies. Um, keeping in mind IMF crisis assistance, there's other things potentially going on in the crisis that could be driving this. Another really, really robust effect we find is a bit sort of counterintuitive. We find in basically every single model, regime change is negatively associated with shell company formation. What you have to keep in mind is we find a positive cross-sectional relationship. So in other words, in politically unstable countries, shell company formation is high all the time, but when the actual regime collapse happens, it falls off, um, is this sort of what we find here. We also find really interesting, complicated stuff, which we actually haven't been able to fully explain conceptually, very, very robust statistically, but very counterintuitive, involving all of these economic institutional changes. What we find is counterintuitively when the legal and property rights regime is getting better, somehow liberalizing, there's a huge spike in shell company formation really, really consistently. Almost the opposite of what we would expect. You'd expect if those things are getting worse, it would trigger this. Another thing that's the opposite of what you would expect is both nationalization and privatization seem to cause shell company formation to drop off um, in non-communist countries. What's especially interesting is you have the liberalization, sort of privatization and legal and property rights reform sort of operating at cross purposes with each other. And when we lump them together into a liberalization factor to sort of combine them, the effect of both effectively disappears. So you have two very, very statistically robust competing effects of privatization and other forms of liberalization sort of operating at cross purposes with each other. Another interesting thing is the IMF intervention effect disappears when you aggregate all of this. So there's some kind of complicated dynamics of reform events happening, these are entangled. Um, this is what the communist countries look like. It's actually really, really different. First of all, it's a bit messier because of sampling, but you still see some interesting stuff. First off, the regime change event effect is still consistent across communist countries, falls off. Another thing you see is a very strong inverse relationship with PPP GDP. It's important to keep in mind, this is looking relative to a country itself over time. Basically what this is saying, is during the period of shock therapy when communist countries had very low per capita income relative to their own long-term average, there's a spike in shell company formation. This is also reinforced by the finding that <clears throat> in communist countries, actually we see an even stronger effect where if the legal and property rights regime is liberalizing or if it's liberal, shell company formation goes up. Um, What's especially interesting though is unlike the non-communist countries where the privatization and liberalization, the different dimensions are at cross purposes, in the communist countries, they reinforce each other. Um, so if we shift to our one dimensional liberalization spectrum, what you see is basically shell company formation shoots up during the liberalization process in communist countries and then stays high where privatization and all of these things are sort of bundled together into a gestalt. All right, so in conclusion, what we've shown is that actually these leaked data sets work really well as dependent variables um, in this kind of analysis. Keeping in mind, it's really difficult to get them to work. It took us about six months to figure out how to run these models um, to get good results. Um, in terms of general findings, first of all, we show that offshore shell company formation is indeed highest in the poorest countries that are most dependent on aid in general. And out of all of these, it's really a pretty perverse pattern. In general, what we show is shell company formation is the highest in the countries that are the most dependent on foreign assistance. And actually we can show a fairly direct causal linkage where it's not only the most money leaving the places that it can essentially least afford to lose the money because the money's leaving, it seems to be to a large extent the same money that's coming in through aid that's actually leaving through the shell companies. Um, so really sort of alarming sort of perverse impacts going off with foreign aid that actually really are much more dominant than basic things like sort of rule of law or general level of development. Foreign aid really seems to stand out here. Um, another really interesting finding is this political instability finding where again, it's high all the time in politically unstable countries, but shell company formation collapses during the actual regime change events. I think this is an important finding generally in terms of how we sort of monitor capital flight because it basically shows and I suspect there's other situations where the time series relationship is actually the mirror image of the causal relationship. So shell company formation is clearly being caused by political instability, but if you drop it just into a time series relationship, you see it looks like actually the opposite of that. Um, another finding that's really puzzling, resource rents are sort of an enigma. Um, we see a pretty clear inverse cross-sectional relationship at the same time a positive time series relationship. 
keeping in mind that it's very, very highly correlated internationally with the commodity price cycle, it makes it very difficult to pull out the country specific effect. Actually, if we take out time fixed effects, resource rents really shoot up as highly significant, but it's very, very difficult to isolate the country specific robust effect. Um, highlights in general this issue of the difficulty of separating out the national frame of analysis, the global frame of analysis with these shell companies given they're intertwined. It looks like in general what we see is the formation of shell companies seems to be pro-cyclical at the global level. So it could be actually the sort of anti-cyclical or even non-cyclical nationally. So it could be to a large extent what's happening with like shell company formation in Nigeria could be, for example, more strongly related to things like the London real estate market than actually what's happening in Nigeria. Um, the final thing we find is that there are big differences in the effects of different types of institutional shocks and reform effects, depending on whether or not a country has communist histories. In communist countries, the story is really simple. When they liberalize, shell company formation shoots up in a general sense and it stays high afterwards. It sort of confirms the worst stereotype of the sort of asset grabs that happened in communist countries during liberalization. What's a bit surprising is it seems to be the reform of the private property rights framework more than the process of privatization that's linked to this, um, which is really a bit of a surprise. We would expect that it would be more the privatization process that would generate this asset grab and not the pro property rights reform. Um, on the other hand, in non-communist countries, things are really, really complicated and we're still trying to sort this out. We get incredibly statistically robust, strong effects involving IMF crisis interventions, legal and property rights reform and privatizations, um, but they're all interacting in a very complicated way. Um, the effects are kind of backwards compared to what you'd expect where the privatization and nationalization seems to cause shell company formation to fall, which is the opposite of what you'd expect. When the property rights are getting better, it actually spikes, um, which is also the opposite of what you'd expect. And in practice, they kind of cancel each other out. Um, I think one, yeah, this is the last point I'd say, I think the one sort of finding that the property rights reform might show is it could be that there's a kind of, when you liberalize the property rights framework and sort of improve the institutional framework, some of these results suggest it could actually set off a sort of shell company party. So, I mean, the sort of standard narrative is worse institutions encourage more shell company formation, but it could look like if you liberalize, if you reform your framework, it may actually in some sense just open the door wider to a lot of this, I think is one interpretation. Um, all right, so that's all that we have today. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much to Dan and Valentina for a fantastic, a fascinating uh, presentation. We basically present not only basically very uh, original innovative data and methodology, but as well, very specific findings who have a massive impact on the role of tax havens or shell companies on development and the correlations that they're presented today between aid and the cultural relation between aid and uh, shell company formation or IMF lending and shell company formation liberalization aid and shell company formation. I think it's fantastic and very interesting to obviously keep talking and analyzing the impact of tax havens and, um, and shell companies on the um, developing countries development. Now I, will, I want to open the floor for questions for uh, anyone from the audience or even uh, the colleagues who presented. We can uh, ask to each other address questions in any way they want. So uh, the floor is open if anyone wanna jump in. No. Yeah, Rogelio, can we look at your results slides again? I'm just curious to like, because some of the stuff you're doing is sort of similarly aligned to what we're doing. So if nobody has any sort of specific questions, I'd just be curious to look at your sort of factor analysis results again. Um, ah, yes, sure. Well, just pull I will up the... try to do it very. Mm. Because yeah, I think a lot of what we're doing, we're looking at things a slightly different way, but some of the analysis is kind of. Yes, wait a second. <clears throat> okay, so is there is it? Yes. Um, well, just very briefly. Just uh, so there was something about the, the factors and clusters that kind of got rushed through. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, but it, it is two, of course, two analysis, this factor analysis that it is based on. Um, We'll put it on the um, 
about 10, 10 variables that I'm using. Um, and here is that, of course, the, the, as you know, the this uh, red cycle is shows the, the how how it uh, uh, how well the 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 the, the factor is playing the, the 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 whole analysis. So we have four factors here, and then of course it is um, when you rotate this component component matrix is what you obtain or. Uh, well, finally, the the components of uh, of the analysis. What's and, bank? And, and what's it, bank and, ST? Sorry. Yes, and and, and then the here is the uh, each factor. It is of course factor analysis is allows a part of interpretation. So we have as uh, variables rule of law, governance effectiveness, control of corruption, foreign direct investment inflows, trade, bank stability, homicide, inflation. <laughs> That's tax, an interesting factor. That's <laughs> revenue, and this financial secrecy index from the tax justice network. And um, and just and well it was interesting to to well to see how how they also connect with the with the with the literature of I mean the, the importance of these variables and then for the I mean in, in order to 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 uh, um, to run the cluster analysis we just take one of the most important variable for each it might change, of course, oh, okay. the, 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 yeah. the analysis if we take another, but in order to, to be more con con consistent with, uh, with all these issues of significance and all this stuff, well, we just take the most relevant variable and, and also well, the, the, um, the idea is just to show this uh, uh, heterogeneity of results depending on the, on the source. But the, 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 what it is, is important uh, that connects with, the, the, with your, your presentation is the, this issue of foreign direct investment in, in terms of the Lucas presentation? Uh, and then, I, of course, I, I took there the, the um, this variable of phantom investment from from um, these uh, guys in, in Norway that they are working uh, intensively with this part with uh, only wider, and uh, and it well, it looks very very uh, well sound sound uh, result. And um, but well, uh, but in any case, so the what is the result? So you're doing cross sectional analysis of this, then I'm just, I'm just curious what the I just, I just I didn't really catch the correlations that you found before. This is curious, I didn't really see the, the result. Oh, I lost your sound. Yeah, there is no audio at all. Uh, I don't have any audio from you. Okay. It, it, just quickly, like a question uh, for Dan and Valentina. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, so, so, so these uh, linkages or correlations that you've shown uh, at the end, that is like a, uh, uh, um, like a uh, linkages between uh, these uh, variables and the country where the client is based, not the country where the shell company is. Yeah, yeah, this is based on the, and so we basically, you have to infer that from the officer location, but basically what we do is we, we screen out all of the countries that would be sort of widely used as an offshore platform. So like we wouldn't include like Liberia um, or like the United Arab Emirates or like even some other places. So like we basically assume that if there's an officer in this country, it must have some kind of an attachment to a local client. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. So it's not based on, we're doing actually another paper looking at the service provider jurisdiction level. Yeah. So basically, we are looking at the push factors of shell company formations rather than the pull factors. So what basically stimulates the client country to incorporate, not the other one. Like, like uh, quickly, I was thinking that like maybe like the improvement like in a property rights in the client country uh, can push a uh, shell company formation because like as rights uh, can be. Mm, 
secured, let's say, like a, a, an African country establishes like a land registry. So like, a, like, like you can you can only own real estate through like a, a foreign shell company if you can ensure that you can a, 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 register like your rights in your home country yeah, so, yeah that's so, exactly that's what we were thinking it could all there could be perverse effects of things like investment treaties or like investor protection where actually if foreign investors are better protected it could actually increase round tripping incentives because then you become a foreign investor i know like um in China, there are some things like this going on with like the preferential treatment of foreign investors with taxation, or at least there used to be until 2008. But yeah, this makes us wonder if there could be a broader perverse effect where you're in theory making the institutions better, but you're actually just sort of putting out the doormat in some ways for like all of this like international structures, basically. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely one explanation. Um, what's, what's puzzling is that... Um, the effects, the sort of negative effect for privatization, and especially in the communist country, that you would really think it would be the privatization events that would make it spike. And what we see is it seems to be really linked to the property rights reform. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so they both work together, but it seems to be more, and you'd almost expect it to be like the opposite, because you would think more shell companies would have to be set off when like there isn't a domestic property rights regime because they're privatized, privatizing before they reform that. Um, so it's a really, a lot of these are really counterintuitive, but they seem to be pretty robust. I don't know, we're still, um, I, think, I guess yeah. that's why it's why it's useful to actually look at the empirics because you see something you don't expect. <laughs> Daniel, and, and your paper is already open? To, to, no, 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 we're actually just in the process of like writing, finishing it right now. Okay, yeah, but because it, it is, a, well, a lot of information, it would be nice to, to, to read it. <laughs> Calm. Yeah, it should be soon. Yes. Yeah. But it's amazing presentation. Yes. Well, any more comments or questions? If anyone? Well, because for, for me, just to, well, to thank everyone, and it would be great to, well, at some point to, to share our, our papers. It would be great in order to, to keep the, the network here. <laughs> and uh, well, I'm thank, of course, Miguel for this wonderful panel. Well, I would, would like to thank all of you for being here and being able to spend your time here with us and have this conversation. Thank you very much for all very amazing papers. I really enjoyed them and looking forward to read them all later on. And definitely we keep in touch. So thank you very much for being here and have a lovely weekend. <laughs>